Good afternoon, this is Andrew Benioff with Lenrock Group and the Lenrock Blog, and I'm very happy to have with us today Jan DeRoos uh, of Cornell University. Um, I've known Jan for a number of years, and uh, not only um, at, at uh, Cornell, but as an advisor to our firm as well. So we're happy to have you. Thanks, Jan, for joining us. Thank you. Really um, Jan is, uh, just as a little background, Associate Professor at Cornell University School of Hotel Administration, where he's been since 1988. Um, he uh, was previously, not only did he get all his degrees, including master's and PhD from Cornell, but also worked extensively in the hospitality industry prior to teaching um, with both Sheraton Corporation and the Remington Hotel Corporation. Um, so Jan, let's talk, we just had a little bit of a meeting today um, and we talked about uh, captive operating platforms in the uh, real estate industry as well as the hospitality industry. What benefits does uh, having a cop captive uh, operating platform offer uh, the lodging industry and are there situations w in which it doesn't make sense for an operator to have a captive uh, uh, operating platform? The term captive operating platform I'm using to uh, talk about firms that with the property uh, firm, the real estate firm is affiliated with an intellectual property firm or a firm that provides management services or brand services. Uh, let me answer your second question first, which is, are there cases in which this does not make sense? It does not make sense when the cash flows are mixed together on those two businesses because the street, uh, especially publicly listed firms, uh, have a difficulty convincing the street of what the proper value is and how to value the real estate flows distinctly from the intellectual property flows. Okay. When you resolve that problem and are able to speak specifically to the cash flows attributable to the real estate and the cash flows attributable to the operating platform, what the operating platform does is bring a huge amount of optionality uh, to the real estate company. It can be a source of deal flow, it can be a source uh, to sell uh, deals to, it can uh, be a source where you could sell a property to another firm who's not capable of managing it and now they might be interested in buying it. It allows you to buy assets that and not worry about whether or not you can find an acceptable manager or not. You have a manager in-house. There are just a tremendous number of really high quality options that come from the relationship. Do, do you think that just sort of following up a little bit on that, you'd mentioned obviously it's, it's something to take into consideration mostly for public companies, whether the cash flows are commingled or not, but with private companies when there's not as much of a, a concern regarding that where you're going to be valued by Wall Street, does it really matter then? I believe it does. Um, I was involved in a class recently in which the real estate partner convince their bank not to foreclose on the real estate as a direct result of the capabilities of the operating company, the bank felt that the asset was best left with the existing borrower and not resolved through a foreclosure or a deed in lieu process. Um, and in that process actually squeezed out a um, mezzanine lender in favor of uh, the borrower. Wonderful. And, th and that, that was the, the company in question you're talking about was a private uh, larger, but but a private firm, not not uh, publicly listed. This correct? is a, a, a high net worth family uh, doing business on, on both the property side and the uh, hotel operating side. Wonderful. Okay, thank you very much. Um, let's look at.